Hello everyone, a very happy new year to you all. I'm your host Nandini Ray and you are listening to the Maitri podcast between friends, conversations with Maitri. This is our first episode of the new year and we are dedicating this episode remembering and honoring those women whom we lost last year to gender-based violence and domestic violence. Gender-based violence is a harsh reality in all communities and South Asian communities, not an exception. In fact, I found a shocking number on South Asian source website that gender-based violence is impacting 48% of the South Asian diaspora in the United States. That is a huge number, which tells us that this problem needs all our attention. And unless we do our part, we cannot end it. We need multiple discussions um, on gender-based violence, partner violence, and domestic violence and abuse so that we can be aware of these issues and we can prevent traumas, damages, and deaths that victims and survivors face. I'm sure today, um, our today's discussion will give our listeners uh, some food for thought on what they can do in preventing this community problem. Today, I have invited two representatives from South Asian SOAR, a national organization dedicated to ending gender-based violence in the South Asian diaspora. And it's my honor to introduce Amrita Doshi and Nashi Gunasekara. Amrita is a co-founder and the executive director of South Asian SOAR, and Nashi is their policy and systems change manager. Thank you, Amrita and Nashi, for being here. Thank you so much, Nandani, for having us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, well, Maitri is a proud m- member of South Asian SOAR family, and uh, thank you for leading this wonderful initiative. Um, would you please introduce SOAR uh, to our listeners? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So South Asian SOAR stands for Survivors, Organizations, and Allies Rising. And it really speaks to all of the people, as Nandini said, that have a part in ending gender-based violence. Um, So SOAR was actually founded in 2020, not too long ago, by and for survivors and community-based organizations that, um, similar to my three, serve South Asian survivors. Mm -hmm. And Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with my three, but what you might not know is that across the U.S., there are around 40 organizations that do similar work. Um, And SOAR is really a body that convenes, brings together, um, and builds community and collective action with those organizations, as well as with individual survivors. Um, And primarily, we do that through building survivor leadership, advocacy and capacity building, but I'm sure we'll get into more of that throughout the rest of the episode. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a nice introduction. Um, the SOAR is leading many um, you know, uh, programs, great programs, campaigns, uh, but today we have you know, very limited time, so we cannot discuss many uh, of your campaigns and programs. I'm sure we will do that um, in future. But today, let's focus on uh, the Remembrance Campaign. That's Their Light Remains. Uh, What a beautiful name. And uh, so what was your intention uh, for launching this campaign, uh, Their Light Remains? Yeah, um, thank you for the kind words and, and also that question. Um, because it really did take us quite a while to think through our intentions and process, and um, it's a privilege to be able to share it. Um, So as, you know, 2022 was unfolding, we were already kind of facing so many tragedies from the years before, but what started to happen is sort of month after month, starting June, we were hearing of a death of a woman due to gender-based violence in California, in Texas, in New York, New Jersey. And I think we collectively hit this moment of like, okay, when is this ending? Or how does it end? Or where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it was around November when we had heard of nine deaths so far, um, where the SOAR team certainly had a reckoning with this feels unprecedented, 
But at the same time, we were seeing data across the US that was telling us that this is happening not just in our community, but every community. Mm -hmm. But it was also at that moment that we were seeing our members kind of grapple with like this challenge of already coming off of a few years of grief, of a lot of difficult and new challenges and wondering how do we process these debts? How do we process these stories? And some of them were clients of our member organizations or they knew their families or they helped arrange the funeral. And how do you come to work the next day and serve another survivor? You know, that was, I think, what we were seeing each of our members go through and really endure. And also asking, like, how do we be there for each other? How do you actually grieve? How do you actually process a death? Um, and that's really the impetus for this. So in around November, we brought our members together and we said, what do you need? Like, what do you need? What do your communities need? And what is moving forward from this look like? And I think the two things we heard were like, we need to slow down and we need to acknowledge what's happened. Like contrary to maybe the way the media portrays it, like we have a very personal and intimate connection to these individuals and their stories. And we sort of need to like have a space to heal and, and grieve and process. But two, we need our community to come together to make a long-term commitment to change. Mm -hmm. um, and so as the SOAR team was thinking through like, okay, what do we need right now? it felt like really responding to that need for healing, for pausing, for kind of counteracting that urgency that we're all so used to and just saying, let's just sit in this for a moment and let's really honor the lives that we lost, honor them as people, let's remember um, and let's make space for ourselves to just, yeah, as I've already said, kind of grieve and process. Um, and I think now she wants to is going to share a little bit about how what that actually looked like in then what came to be their light remains. Yeah, yeah, Go thank, ahead. yeah, thank you. Um, so when we were thinking about their light remains, we knew that this was likely going to take place on a virtual platform, and so we thought very critically about what it meant to create a virtual space for community healing, and you know what that would really look and feel like from a community member um, engaging on a social media post um, or even via comments. We wanted people to really feel um, like whether they were familiar with gender-based violence or not, that they could feel safe and welcome enough to learn about these lives for the first time or feel safe and um, yeah, welcome enough, I just go back to those words, to engage in a way that feels most meaningful and restorative to them. So when we were kind of thinking about the different campaign elements, we really le leaned into the values that Amrita spoke to, healing, honoring, and being very community-centered. So when it comes to the imagery, we really wanted to uplift the beauty and light of our lost community members really reclaiming the fullness of our lives that we felt wasn't necessarily reflected in the way that the mainstream media was um, documenting these lives and these stories. And most importantly, we wanted to invoke a sense of connectedness um, to our lost community members, especially in a virtual space that, that was a challenge and required some kind of intentionality around um, whether it was the colors that we used, the certain imagery that we used, um, and just the way that it was visually represented. I think um, all of those elements uh, played a role in kind of invoking this sense of community, even though we were all experiencing their light remains in our own spaces. And you know, then- The images were so heart touching and it's like social media, they have their power on their own. Like, you know, we, um, I'm sure that the, these through, since we use social media platform, it, this campaign uh, reached to uh, to regular normal people, uh, to all community members. So that those who are following uh, social media platforms for all these organized partner organizations, and I would like to um, state here that if someone is listening to this podcast now and don't know about this campaign, please feel free to go to Source um, Network, a Source uh, website, uh, or Matri's uh, Facebook page, um, or uh, any um, organization like from uh, any domestic violence organization. Um, 
uh, South Asian Domestic Violence Organization uh, in New York, uh, in uh, Chicago, in um, uh, San Francisco, wherever you are, uh, you know, based in, you follow their uh, most, I think most uh, South Asian um, uh, DV organization social media pages, they, um, they portrayed that uh, campaign. Uh, so please, and do you, uh, Nashi, can you please, uh, uh, tell uh, our audience that where can they find uh, this campaign on your page? Yes, um, I am pulling it up right now. <laughs> um, so you can visit southasiansoar.org backslash their light remains, and that'll take you to our campaign um, remembrance page where we have our letter to our community. We have all the portraits shared, our calls to action, um, and also ways to join us in this movement work. Yeah, so thank you so much. I, I hope that people will uh, go uh, to this page uh, to see this campaign. And it's so sad that we lost so many, uh, like uh, nine, 10 beautiful souls to this, uh, to this disturbing acts of gender-based violence from our community. And, and in some of these cases, we saw that women were killed after they left their abusive relationships. Like, um, for example, Sadia Manzoor, uh, she was shot to death by her estranged uh, husband. Um, and he also killed their daughter and uh, Sadia's mom. Uh, Sania Khan, who was also shot by her estranged husband, Gurpit uh, Kaur, was shot by her father-in-law because uh, she was planning to get a divorce. So not only these cases, we as advocates, we saw many times many um, other cases where leaving abusive relationship proved dangerous uh, for women. Um, so there is no guarantee for their safety. And uh, so they're not safe when they're in their abuse relationship, when they're suffering from abuse and violence. And if they're leaving, they're also in danger. Um, so, you know, uh, Amrita and Nashi, what's your thought on this, that why are we failing uh, uh, women in our community? Why are we failing them as a community? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'd love to, to touch on both of those questions. One, why women um, face increased risk to their safety even after they leave abusive relationships and then, you know, where our community's role is in supporting survivors. Um, and first, I want to acknowledge that um, even though we talk about gender-based violence and we're referring to um, how this relates to women, gender-based violence can affect anybody regardless of their gender identity. And um, we use the gender identity women largely because the survivors we lost in 2022 to our the best of our knowledge identified as women. So just wanted to put that disclaimer out there. Mm -hmm. um, but leaving an abusive situation is incredibly complex and um, for a number of reasons that I'll get into. And that's not to stoke fear, but it's really to call upon us as a community to understand where we can proactively support survivors who are trying to leave. Um, but to just touch on a few reasons um, why leaving an abusive situation um, does not suddenly close that chapter. I mean, separation abuse is a very real factor affecting survivors who attempt to leave abusers. Um, separation abuse generally describes the escalation of abuse and tactics used against a survivor to keep them in an abusive situation. And this ranges from stalking to stalling court proceedings um, to, as we've seen, death threats and even death. Um, other factors that complicate uh, the process of leaving an abusive situation, a lack of community support. Uh, many South Asians don't have support from their communities or families due to shame and repudiation around leaving a marriage um, or relationship. Another factor you is- You are absolutely right. Many times when they try to leave or they try to talk about their abuse, uh, most women, they face one question uh, that, you know, uh, why are you talking about this issue? Are you, are you sure you're- So they're, they're shamed or blamed. And if they don't leave, then they are questioned that why didn't you leave? If it is so hard, the abuse is so hard, why didn't you leave? 
So yeah. that is really, really, I mean, where do they go? If they don't leave, then this is their fault. If they leave, then, then also it's their fault. So we really need a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion on this topic. So um, yeah, Nashi, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. I mean, and, and to that point, um, you know, in six of the 10 known survivors that we lost last year, there was a familial pressure to not dissolve the marriage or to not leave the marriage. Just to speak to your point of so much pressure to to stay in a marriage or a relationship that is abusive. Um, and really putting survivors in this in this catch-22 of if you leave, um, you're going to face repudiation. And if you stay, then, um, you know, we're going to ask you why you didn't leave. Mm. Um, another factor is financial security. A lot of survivors don't have access to savings because their abuser um, controls the finances and limits what they have access to. Um, and just another data point speaking to um, what we saw last year in six of the 10 known survivors that we lost, um, the victim and or abuser came from either poor or low income or working class backgrounds. So that really speaks to kind of the, um, the common thread of um, economic security that plays a really critical role in um, being able to leave a, an abusive situation. Mm -hmm. And lastly, a big common thread is the element of immigration. Um, the fear of seeking out help in any capacity, whether it's to law enforcement or your lo local service agency, um, having an immigration status that is really anything other than US citizenship can really cause fear and uncertainty and what consequences may come from seeking out help, um, whether that means consequences for you yourself or your children. Um, and this also played a really big element in six of the 10 known deaths. Um, the victim's immigration status was tied to their abuser's immigration status. So when we think about what they have to lose on top of everything else, um, you know, the, the point about immigration and being tied to an abuser status really complicates um, how easy or not easy it might be to leave an abusive situation. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then also, you know, gender-based violence is also intertwined with uh, every other social crisis like gun violence, uh, reproductive injustice, um, economic injustice, uh, mental health, immigration issues that uh, that you pointed out. And, you know, the three of them are killed uh, because of, uh, you know, it's a gun, uh, also a gun violence, not only a gender-based violence, also a gun violence. Um, and there's so many cases they, that, you know, survivors, they suffer in silence for, you know, for various areas like economic control, immigration control, uh, mental health issue. And um, it's it's so sad that, uh, that this is 2023 and we are not, um, you know, many community members, they are not paying um, attention to this problem. And actually patriarchy teaches us that women are, women are not enough on their own. They need um, a male guardian, so to, so to speak. Like in many countries, still uh, we see that women need a male legal guardian, mm -hmm. male legal guardian. And that, that role is accepted by patriarchal communities. Um, there's so many overt and uh, covert uh, ways that uh, gender abuse and inequalities are normalized. Um, but this is a high time that we we do our part in addressing and ending gender-based violence. So, uh, so tell our audience that uh, what is SOAR doing in uplifting survivors' voices um, and bringing a change um, in our community? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm happy to sort of ex expand on our work towards that. Um, you know, Nandini, at the beginning, you mentioned like, the statistic of 48% of South Asians in the U.S. experience some form of violence. And I feel like the data and statistics are so powerful for us to just give an immediate understanding of what is the breadth of that problem? How many yeah. people does it impact? Um, but I do think something that we've lacked so far is maybe nuance around how, what, why it happens. And often, you know, I don't know, I think even the way nonprofits or 
fundraising and et cetera have shaped our stories. They tend to focus on like a victim who is sad. And like, that is the narrative that's put forward. Um, and something I think collectively we're seeing a trend towards is more stories, more stories about survivorship and what, how complex that journey really is. So um, one of SOAR's core programming areas is focusing on survivor st storytelling and leadership. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to point out something that I think you would find particularly interesting. Um, SOAR ran the pilot of its survivor storytelling program this year, and 50% of its 16 participants are service providers. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like, it's just healing is needed all around. Survivorship is all around. Survivors are within and outside of organizations, within and outside of like a quote unquote movement, um, within and outside of our families. Like the, it's everywhere. Um, and I think we really view stories as a tool to uplift those voices and bring change because theory around storytelling is it has dramatic impacts on healing on changing mindsets and that means we can change culture and we can change norms like patriarchy um but it can also impact funding and it can also impact policy in a way that sometimes data can't or it's the combination of data and stories um so yeah we really focus on survivor storytelling and their light remains is a version of that or a manifestation of focusing on the people and their stories and telling that um and yeah, then you're absolutely right. I mean, so, I mean, you know, these stories will prove that, uh, you know, this is a this is a social problem. It's a community problem, and sometimes survivors they feel that when they suffer in silence, they feel that they are the only one. Yes. Um, so they should know that there are others, and and it is not their fault. I mean, and some do, uh, suffering domestic violence is cannot be a survivor's fault or victim's fault, and they they have every they can have every opportunity to break the shackle and to to empower themselves. So um, I have a one question, Amrita. Where can they? I mean, if community members they have they need to read those stories how can they get access to those stories that is a wonderful question um so soar just ran its pilot this year we're actually launching a storytelling platform to share mm -hmm. those stories but i will say like go to each community-based organization. Like Maitri has a magazine of these stories, right? Udan, like there are so many ways that these stories are told and SOAR yeah. is working on compiling them in our own way, but they exist and follow an organization, go to their events and that's where you'll hear the stories. Um, I That would be my advice for a community member who wants to hear about them and, and talk to an organization. Like you as an individual probably have so many stories that you know and that, you can share um, just to give someone a better sense of what gender yeah, is. Yeah, is you are right. I mean, our podcast is one of the platforms. Yes, that we, we invite you know survivors who are who um have who showed uh, their courage and resilience, and now they're they're empowered. They're they're helping others to heal. So yeah. we yeah. So uh, thank you. So yeah, go ahead. Um. No, and, and then the second piece, which my three was also a part of, is our first report, Together We Rise. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that also Their Light Remains showed us is that doing this together has a very um, transformative impact on sending a message, right? Like, it's hard for each one of us as individual, an individual survivor, an individual organization to get a message across and bring change. But when we compile those trends, when we compile those stories, and we're able to put forth a resounding message that's shared. Um, that is source work also, which is bringing together like research and advocacy that is directly from the community um, mm -hmm. in national forums. So whether that's a report or you know, hopefully in the future a conference or um, we have an exciting public awareness campaign coming up. Like those are the ways that um, we really seek to bring change. And I would say like. They're all focused on the values that Nashi and I were speaking about earlier, like dialogue, bringing community together. And we've talked about this idea of like, it's all, it's on us. It's on all of us. We all have a role um, and really honoring the survivorship of, um, yeah, every survivor really honoring their stories and um, their resilience. 
Oh, great. Thank you for sharing your work. And, uh, but I would <laughs> like to say that, you know, advocates and survivors alone cannot end gender-based violence. So, so all community members, they must take uh, some role. They must take their part, do their part in identifying, addressing, and analyzing uh, cultural and systemic flaws that are enabling gender-based violence so that they can take part in a prevention. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you uh, are given a chance to send out a message to uh, to your community members, then what that uh, what would that be uh, for for how they can help in prevention? Yeah. And I, I just want to say I really like that you included the word analyzing because I feel like that's often not included. It's like action and it's like reading, but. I think there is this piece of like reflection and analysis that's very personal. It requires you to look inwards mm -hmm. and say, why is this happening? And where might I also be doing it? And I think that's one of my biggest messages is what you said earlier, like each of us plays a part. That's why SOAR's name has the word allies in it. It's not just survivors and organizations rising, it's survivors, organizations, and allies mm -hmm. rising. Um, and and what you just say that uh, reflecting on uh, each of us, we have responsibility to reflect on our own behavior, Absolutely. whether we are taking part, you know, directly or indirectly um, in any uh, gender um, abuse or inequality. So, uh, so I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there's, there's so many things you can do. I just want to focus on on one that's very personal and then one that's more sort of external facing. But um, I think on the personal level, like you have to do the daily work of ending and removing, preventing gender-based violence, but also cultivating healthy relationships. Mm, and absolutely. that, yeah, that happens um, as parents, as a partner, a spouse, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, like whatever um, relationships you're in, as an in-law, um, as a friend, like each of those relationships can actually like perpetuate harmful norms mm -hmm. and harm also, you know, doesn't just mean like physical abuse. There are so many ways of using the tactics of patriarchy or of control or power to limit someone from living a, a free and happy and joyful and safe life. And so I feel like one of our biggest messages is super personal and it is to reflect on the ways that you are seeing these behaviors in your life and mm -hmm. that you might be a part of them to interrupt and disrupt those patterns and then to also stand up for them when you see that judgment or shame being like spoken about like that's an opportunity for you to intervene to share another way of thinking about things absolutely um, absolutely and then lastly, I just want to uplift that so much work is already happening by each of these community-based organizations. And one thing super tactically to do is to support them and learn from them, improve and, uh, you know, build your analysis with them because that's work that's been going on for decades and we still haven't invested in it as much as we can as a community. Yeah, so volunteer for those communities, uh, you, you know, offer them your time, your skill, your resources so that you can be part of the prevention um, work. Yeah. And, you know, we all know that uh, policy um, makers, they also, uh, they must take a huge role in prevention. And so if you are given a chance to make an appeal to policymakers, then what uh, would that be? Great question. Um, I first want to say that policy can is really a gate kept and complex world. I think the words people use, the how inaccessible um, led the like legislation and legislators can feel, um, can make us feel really small. It can make community members feel really small. But um, in my experience, it's really simple. Like good policy is informed by those closest to the issues, those impacted by the issues and those closest to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and so my appeal to policymakers is really twofold. And, and the first being, um, don't just meet with mainstream gender-based violence organizations, meet with us, make the explicit effort to identify um, 
connect with and invest in culturally specific organizations like SOAR and our member organizations to understand exactly where existing protections are failing us and where increased protections are needed. Um, Nandini, you mentioned like South Asians are impacted by a number of intersectional issues like gun violence, reproductive justice, immigration, economic injustice, and so many others. But our experiences as South Asians are often erased by the pervasive model minority myth. And mm -hmm. so our voices are really needed at these policy and budget tables. Um, and the first step in doing so is for policymakers to see, invite us not only as collaborators, but also as experts um, and to really see the value in us. Um, yeah, absolutely. Be able to contribute. And then I'll just end with saying um, my second appeal to policymakers would be to really shift the investment from criminalizing gender-based violence and instead supporting and healing those impacted by gender-based violence. And this means investing in solutions like transformative justice and investing in culturally specific community-based organizations that respond uniquely to the needs of their client populations and greater community. Um, so, and this also means strengthening existing uh, protections and public systems that prevent South Asians from seeking help in general. So this looks like increasing language access. We don't all speak one language. We speak more than 20 different languages. So um, meet those needs, meet our needs there and expanding immigrant survivor protections like the WISE Act is um, proposing. And really though, above all, um, we, meaning communities, frontline organizations, policymakers, funders, really everyone in this ecosystem of change really need to start learning about and investing in gender-based violence prevention. Because at the end of the day, our shared goal is to live and be part of communities that are liberated from violence. And that can't happen if we're only focusing on intervention. We need to start um, thinking more broadly about prevention. Um, so yeah, if I could speak to policymakers, that is my broad message. <laughs> I hope one day we will, you know, uh, meet them and uh, talk to them and present your appeal to them. Uh, so thank you, Amrita and Nashi, for coming to our show and sharing your knowledge and advocacy with our listeners. Um, thank you for your work uh, in ending uh, gender-based violence. Um, I hope I could continue this discussion, but uh, you know, time is a factor. So um, I'm uh, hoping that we will come back again uh, to, dis to continue this discussion. Thank you, Nandini, for having us and asking these questions and really like engaging us in this conversation about the role of community and also, I think, prevention in a way that maybe like we are moving towards speaking about more. Um, and thank you, yeah, to, to every listener who um, even just listening to this podcast is a commitment to ending gender-based violence. Um, but yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So gender-based violence and abuse is a complex problem which uh, doesn't have a simple solution. But raising awareness about this issue, education, creating more inclusive policies to dismantle uh, systemic uh, inequalities and empowering all genders to achieve education, um, economic freedom and equality in relationships are some of the basic steps that can help in prevent preventing gender-based violence, right? 100%. So on our podcast, we are um, continuously addressing and analyzing different aspects of this issue so that we can break uh, the silence around this problem and mobilize all community members in creating a society where all relationships are built on dignity, equity, and compassion. Uh, listeners, please keep listening to our podcast and please like and share. Find all our episodes on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple, Google, and wherever you listen to your podcast. I think you uh, will get a lot of information and resources on our podcast um, uh, that you can share to save someone's life. Uh, this is your host, Nandini Ray, signing off today. Um, thank you for being with us. This show is for informational purposes only and is not to be construed as legal advice. Always consult an attorney for legal advice. Views expressed by guests of the radio show are individual opinions and not endorsed by Maidri.
This project was made possible by funding provided by Santa Clara County Office of Gender-Based Violence Prevention.